Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Short Circuit. I'm your host, Daryl Willis, CVP for Energy and Resources at Microsoft, and I'm thrilled to have you join me as we do a deep dive into hot topics surrounding the energy transition, which is a subject that is near and dear to many of us. We'll be hearing from industry experts and thought leaders uh, doing these uh, conversations, and they'll share their insights and perspectives on the current state and future of the energy sector. Today's session is all about data and analytics, the engine that will drive the future of the energy industry. I'm really excited to say that we've got a very special guest, Tom Dietrich, president and CEO of ITRON. ITRON is a global technology leader, driving some of the most significant advancements in power and utilities uh, and beyond. From smart meters to smart grids to smart cities, the contribution of ITRON is making a significant dent in our journey on the energy transition and their work is commendable. Welcome and thank you for joining us today, Tom. Thank you very much for, for having me and uh, I appreciate the partnership, Daryl. Awesome. And I'd like to get the discussion going by diving in right into a topic that's grappling, that's the industry is grappling with today, which is around data. Is there too much data or not enough data for the sector? What are your views? Paradoxically, I think the answer to your question is yes and no simultaneously, but bear with me for just a moment while I, I try to unpack that. Um, I think historically the grid was a one-way push. Uh, think about it as large generation fossil fuels and more and more renewables now uh, to consumption down to your house. But uh, the premise of how the grid was designed was, was based on this one-way flow. It was a fire and forget, for lack of a better way to describe it. You had plentiful energy, you had relatively predictable and stable demand, and this, this approach works so long as that's the case. Okay, it may not be as efficient as it can be, but at least you, you've got a way to, to control it. Now, start changing things. Fossil fuels uh, start to, uh, uh, they definitely provide reliable generation, uh, but they also uh, are increasingly scarce and now you've got more emissions. Add renewables, it solves problem, part of this dilemma, but now you have variable generation. So sometimes the wind doesn't blow and the sun doesn't shine. And you also have changing consumption patterns. Suddenly we all decide we're no longer gonna work in city centers, we're gonna work from home uh, with the, the start of COVID or we're going to have more and more EVs on the grid, uh, electric vehicles change the, the consumption pattern quite a bit. So traditionally, that this balanced and stable supply and demand pattern allowed grid operators to work without a lot of visibility through the distribution grid. Um, when that equation changes, you now have a very, very different uh, setup, and that's where we are today, and it, this is increasingly true. So fortunately, we've got some technologies to be able to deal with this, more visibility down to the edge of the grid, that produces more data. And coming directly to the point that you made, is it too much or, or, or not enough? I think the key in all of this for, for us as an industry, for, for Microsoft and iTron together, is to make sure we've got the right data at the right place at the right time so we can take action. Um, a great example of this that I would give you is, is how we work with Tampa Electric Company. They've deployed the latest uh, solution that we have, think of it as, as downloadable applications into the endpoint. We call it distributed intelligence. This allows Tico to deploy suddenly hundreds of thousands of new sensors, new measurement points on the grid that they didn't have before. You add individual applications and agents to, to that, and you can discover new things for safety and reliability and how consumers can uh, work more collaboratively with the utility. And this creates something that was previously undetectable, uh, mm -hmm. but the combination of back office analytics, things like Azure, and this downloadable application mm -hmm. and edge processing is a different way of operating. It. And that's what I mean by the right data at the right time. Uh, and, and that's what really can change how the, the energy transition will move in the future. Fantastic. So speaking of the energy transition and continuing on with that conversation time, a big focus uh, as I've talked to power and utility companies and the sector more broadly has been a huge interest and concern around grid reliability and resilience. And you know better than I, we've had lots of power, power outages over the last several years. Uh, for various things like hurricanes and other uh, extraordinary weather events. And the number of weather events, frankly, has doubled since 2002. The frequency and the length of outages have reached 
lately the highest levels since tracking has actually started. And I think about my own situation last year, I found myself in New Orleans doing Hurricane Ida. We had Hurricane Ian late last year in Florida, and now we've had some challenges in California. What I'd love to hear is your perspective on how the industry is leveraging data and analytics to further drive increased levels of reliability and resilience, especially as we deal with more unexpected and more unpredictable extreme weather events. What are your thoughts? Indeed, the utility industry is facing a pretty difficult situation. You, you, you've correctly stated it. Weather volatility, climate disruption, these storms are becoming more common. Uh, I read an interesting stat over the weekend. Uh, this was a Bloomberg stat, but $165 billion of estimated damages from just 17 natural disasters uh, uh, in 2022. And it really doesn't matter where in the world you are. Atmospheric rivers in California or wildflower fires in Australia and floods in Europe and hurricanes and ice storms in Texas, where, where I live, uh, no uh, part of the globe is spared from all of this. And you combine that with the point that we made in, in our in the previous conversation uh, of as more things get electrified and you live in a more connected society, the need for the lights to stay on and clean, reliable water to, to, to work every time you turn on the tap, that increases in importance. And so the ability to cope with these events, which is the, the core of your question, I think it comes in the nature of preventing outages and should one actually occur, fixing it as fast as possible. And the how you do that really is the visibility at what's actually happening and where is it happening and the use of the data. So when you do need to roll a truck, you can roll it to the scene of the crime and, and not just uh, drive up and down the freeway to find out what's going on. So we've worked with customers to do things with distribution automation to automatically reroute power or to have pole tilt sensors. So when a hurricane does blow ashore, if the pole's tilted, you can find out where it is. Wind detection with line sensors. Um, you can understand what's happening proactively with foliage by monitoring things with uh, voltage variation and impedance on, on the lines. So you can cut the branches back before you, you have a major outage. And it's not only weather that creates these types of things, it could be electric vehicles. Uh, uh, you have too many EVs that decide they wanna charge in the same cul-de-sac, that distribution transformer uh, that's feeding that, that cul-de-sac may not be sized anymore, but by monitoring what's happening on the grid, you can see one EV, two EV, three EV, oops, I'm gonna have a problem if the fourth one comes. So you can automatically go and say, hey, let's upsize this distribution transformer. All of that happens, again, when you've got the right data to, to be able to, uh, to find out what's happening in the grid and be able to take action in, in a quick way. We worked with Con Ed as an example. Um, a big uh, uh, thunderstorm uh, band blew through back in, in August of 2020, and uh, it could have taken out power from uh, 800,000 customers. Uh, it produced tons of tornado tornadoes and high wind gusts, but uh, uh, through the use of data and, and the system that was already in place, ComEd avoided uh, 700,000 of those outages and was able to restore power back within 24 hours, sometimes automatically by, by rerouting a, a particular transformer that was, uh, was damaged, but mostly understanding what was happening at the edge of the grid without, un, without needing to go out and roam around the city to be able to find it. You knew what was happening from the back office and you could deploy your crews far, far more efficiently. That is actually great to hear because I think about, Tom, when, uh, again, when I was in New Orleans doing Hurricane Ida, I had a chance to witness the interventions being manual, people getting in cars with clipboards, going out and making observations, and that takes a lot of time and just delays to the restoration of energy. So that's a, thank you for sharing that, uh, that real life fascinating example. One of the other things that that I've been really intrigued about uh, over the course of the last three or four years since I've been at Microsoft is just this whole notion of consumers of energy becoming producers of energy, these so-called prosumers. And one of the things I would love to get your thoughts on is, uh, as we think about the addition of rooftop solar, battery storage, and other contributing and distributing energy resources back into the grid, how are power and utility organizations adjusting to this new paradigm? And does this change, uh, will this change how power and utility companies interact with their customers? 
Well, I certainly think it will. I mean, that the trend that you talked about is alive and well uh, across the globe. Uh, uh, the, the estimate from Gartner says by 2025, the amount of distributed energy resources that are behind the meter, if you will, so rooftop mm-hmm. solar or a power wall in your garage or something like that, uh, is, is going to exceed what is in front of the meter, the full generation side, by, by nearly 50%. Whether that that prediction is true or not, the amount of uh, uh, distributed energy resources that are in the grid is increasing exponentially. And this is a blessing and a curse viewed from from the view of of the utility uh, or or the consumer. You've got to be able to uh, to control these resources and hopefully you can make the whole thing work more efficiently. Hey, let's charge your EV when the sun is shining on my rooftop. Uh, a, a, as an example, that way you wouldn't have to push as much um, energy from a central generation point. But understanding what's in that grid and optimizing the the control of all of that it is something that, again, if you think about that one-way push in the grid, it wouldn't be possible without the use of data and, and those sensors and endpoints at, at the edge of the grid. So that's the, the exciting part for the utility to be able to control all of that. But think about it through, through the lens of the consumer. Um, it, it, it requires tremendous, tremendous trust. Are you going to allow your utility company to use your EV as a portable battery to, to feed energy back into the grid um, or, or not. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, people do that today with things like Nest Thermostat. They allow you to adjust the, uh, the, the, uh, the control, the temperature in your house by a degree or two a few times per year. It's, of course, you know, interesting, uh, but you think about all these other distributed energy assets, you now have a very, very different level of trust that needs to happen between the consumer yep. and the, uh, the utility. Um, that, that means the utility has got to get much closer to to their consumer customer. Uh, I would venture a guess that probably the last time many people interacted with the utility is when you're ringing them up saying the lights are out and when are they going to be back on and and they or may not have even known uh, what's going on uh, at, at the edge of the grid without this increased uh, uh, visibility. So reading that closer relationship, that relationship of trust will be an important part uh, a cultural change, even on top of the technologies that that we are talking about, we've seen utilities do this effectively. Uh, I'll mm-hmm. use uh, a customer of ours in Germany called Eon. Uh, they increased their net promoter scores. If I use that as the metric uh, in dealing with their customers by engaging with them in such a way that they they could help individual consumers understand how they were utilizing, uh, how they were consuming things. What was happening at the individual utility or, or appliance level? Rather, hey, your washing machine's getting a little wonky, and uh, perhaps it'd be time to get some maintenance or replace it because uh, you can see those types of things by by looking at how consumption patterns change. And Eon was able to increase their net promoter score pretty dramatically, bringing that trust, which opens up the possibility to deploy the technologies to optimize the uh, the grid much more fully. Um, so there's a technology piece and a culture piece that I think are really important for us to to think about as providers and and technology providers to the utility customers. Fantastic, and I I love in the examples that you've shared and the customer references you're making. Your customers are our customers, which I think really uh, speaks to the strength of the relationship between between our two companies. I'd like to switch the topic to cybersecurity now, because that's a major concern for many, in particular, a major concern for the power and utilities uh, sector. The industry has grappled with a couple of significant events over the last year or so, one being the Colonial Pipeline ransomware attack that took place, and in, in most recently, uh, uh, late just last year in Germany, a large wind farm was uh, the victim of a cyber attack. From your perspective, um, what steps are utility companies taking to ensure grid security in the face of these uh, bad actors? As you know, cybersecurity and security in general is always multifaceted. You've got to build in layers of defense, and that's exactly what I see our utility customers doing to deal with the, the risks that we're talking about. First and foremost, the weak link in in, uh, in most systems tends to be the, the human element. 
Uh, so increasing awareness and training as to, to what is uh, uh, that the right way to uh, to secure an operation, whether it is blocking the doors physically, but it is also uh, not clicking on the wrong link, as you know. But that that uh, training and, and dealing with the utility customer, uh, their, their employees, uh, as with all enterprises, is, is an important step. Second, I would say, is the supply chain piece of this, which is vetting what happens all the way through their supply chain. And that means uh, you know, ITRON as, as well as Microsoft and everyone else that they deal with so that they are thinking about country of origin. They are for, for hardware. Uh, they're thinking about the supply chain and the, the build process from a uh, uh, from a software perspective, uh, a, la, a kind of a solar winds uh, uh, type of, of event. And third, utilities have assets out in the wild uh, that they really do have physical security. I mean, you, you've heard about cases where bad actors were, were doing things to, to substations uh, and knowing how to disable them. But yeah. the last thing is uh, the last point I would make on, on this topic uh, would be the valuable role for both Microsoft and, and, and iTron from a network and application level security. There's there's a lot that we can do as utilities are absolutely increasing migrating from their own data centers where they they had everything within their own four walls to using things like Azure and making sure that we are very thoughtful about protecting that data and making sure that we don't do anything to disturb the, the, the trust that I talked about with consumers. We've got to protect the consumer data on behalf of the utilities as well. There's always more to be done, but I see a lot of those, those steps in place with our customers today. Awesome. And, and you're actually right. It is something that uh, we see as our license to operate. So protecting assets, data assets, is uh, the thing that we spend a disproportionate share of our time focusing on. Tom, I know you're very, very busy. I had one last question I wanted to ask you, and it's really around sustainability. Uh, it's an area of, of, of extreme importance to Microsoft, as you know, and core to our mission. And I'd love for you to share a little bit about how your organization is approaching sustainability, what challenges you're facing, and how you're helping others in the industry reach their own sustainability goals. Our companies are kindred spirits in, in that respect, where sustainability and efficiency has been at the core of, of what ITRON has been trying to do for our customers and for, for 40 years uh, running and, and continues on. As such, sustainability reads directly on our business. The whole notion of creating a more resourceful world is exactly that idea. So two aspects that I think are important. One is our own activities. So uh, our, our goal is to reduce our uh, uh, owned emissions by uh, by 50% from the 2019 baseline by the time we get to, to 2028, and we're, we're well on our way to being able to do that. The second part of the story, which is the thing that I think is is really, really exciting and interesting for, for our company, it's the leverage that the use of our products creates for our customers. When a, a utility customer uh, gets a hold of the data that we're talking about uh, throughout this conversation and utilizing it, you're now reducing truck rolls, you're preventing outages, you're enabling uh, renewables onto the grid, you're balancing supply and demand and optimizing the usage of all of those things. And what we see today is it's well over 100 pounds of, of CO2 equivalent per year per endpoint with just the use cases that we've deployed today. Okay, 100 may not sound like like much, but uh, uh, it, it gets multiplied by millions and millions and millions of endpoints, and it gets um, th that that's a single year. And now you start utilizing these assets over 10 or 20 years, it quickly dwarfs our own emissions a as a company and the power and the leverage that you get by deploying these applications. Uh, I I'm truly excited about what we can do with more and more applications. So that that more than 100 pound kind of number is just what has been deployed historically. There's lots more we do with the data um, and taking that that right data at the right time for uh, actionable intelligence is, is really uh, the power in, in the model. And, and it is something that uh, I'm truly, truly excited about and excited about partnering with, with Microsoft. There, there's much we can do together here and amazingly optimistic about what we can do for the planet as well as the uh, the efficiency and sustainability of our utility customers. Fantastic. Tom, thank you so much for your time today and 
more importantly, thank you for your partnership with uh, Microsoft. Um, enabling grid resiliency and operational efficiency and never losing sight of customers is something that's important to us. I know it's deeply important uh, to you all as well. Uh, I believe and and all of us at Microsoft believe that the future is bright and I'm confident that that together. And Itron and Microsoft working with the broader power and utilities community will truly help accelerate, enable and further digitize the energy transition. Once again, to everyone who has listened today, thank you for joining us for the Short Circuit. Be sure to join us next time as we unpack more hot topics and trends surrounding the energy transition. Thank you very much and take care.